Mm. Good morning, everyone. Good, very early morning for people who live in the same time zone as Carrie and Alisa. We're going to get started in a minute just to give time for people to trickle in and uh, as importantly, welcome everyone. Hmm. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. It's 11 a.m. It's time for us to start our uh, Activity Strong Paluta. So a few words of uh, background. My name is Charles de Vionren. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. And I am just uh, beyond thrilled and excited to be with you all. It's, um, it's our fourth summit, believe it or not. And uh, just before getting on, we beat uh, our numbers from last year and the previous year where we had more than 2,000 people registered. Now, it's a long event, so we don't expect everyone to be on, but it's just marvelous. And I think that it truly speaks to the importance of what we're going to be doing and talking and brainstorming and collaborating on. And so if some of you uh, have no idea what you're doing here, I'm sure you're not the only one. But I can tell you a little bit what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the most important part of our senior living industry. Uh, Link Senior started Activity Strong a little bit more than four years ago uh, in the spirit of acknowledging the amazing work of activities and life remote professionals, educating them and empowering them. But I think it's really important to remind ourselves that we're doing this with amazing organizations, which are actually our keynotes today for our summit which are NAP, and CAP, and Activity Connection. So the three of you, before I formally introduce you, I just wanted to thank you and just tell you how excited we are to have you. Um, Activity Strong, you know, we, we started this in 2020 as conferences and events were being canceled. And again, with this partnership, with these three amazing organizations, we were able to create something I'm a little bit biased, I'll say it's magical, but if you're the first one on our summit or our webinars, I'll let you decide today. Um, but we're very, very glad that it continues. It continues for two reasons. One, the passion of our activity professionals and obviously our common love of older adults. So today's exceptional, as I mentioned, we have exceptional record numbers, but we also have exceptional speakers that I'm about to introduce. Before I do that, a quick reminder of our housekeeping, which is that we all can earn up to six NAB, NCAP, NCTRC, or NCCDPC credits. To earn the credits, you need to attend the four sessions, so as few as one, if you only want one credit, or as many as six. Uh, you need to fill up the survey that we'll send you uh, by June 30th, so at the end of this week. And we'll be able to issue, again, up to six hours of uh, CUs. And then because of the high number of attendees, because of the holiday weekend, please expect these to be sent to you uh, by July 7th. If you have any questions, please send them towards webinars with an S at linksenior.com. As a reminder, this is recorded, so I know many of you are watching this together. Many of you will be watching this later. Everyone's welcome. And obviously, we're using Zoom, where both the chat and the Q&A features are enabled. Uh, if you want to chat with everyone and contribute to the amazing conversation that has already happened because we've reached more than 99 comments in there, uh, please make sure to select the everyone. So why are we here? We're here to have leadership lessons of what I personally believe to be the most important part of senior living, right? So that's activities and life promotion professional. So we're going to hear about their voice, the voice of activity and life promotion professionals. And there is no better people on the planet Earth than Alice Tag, Association Director of NAP, Linda Redhead, President of NCAP, and Carrie Fairchild. Fairchild? I forget what I told you the other day, Carrie. Carrie Fairchild, <laughs> Community Marketing Specialist with Activity Connection. So with that, I know that uh, Alice is going to get us started. Welcome, everyone. Alice, thank you so much, and I'll let you take it over from here. Thank you so much, Charles, for the warm welcome. And I know I speak for Linda and Carrie that we are super excited to be with you once again this year and to talk about, you know, a, an important topic that we find as activity professionals super 
necessary in this time of industry. And so let's go ahead and let's talk about this next summit that we're on today and how we are able to come together and be a part of the, the next summit. So go ahead, Charles, go ahead and pass that on. And I think it's really cool because, you know, here we are, we're at a new summit, it's a new year, it's 2023. And I wanted to ask myself as we were in preparation for this summit, what have I accomplished over the last year? You know, what has changed in my life over the last year since our last summit together? And I'm hoping that you're asking the same question of yourself and, you know, and thinking about that. And many of us may think to ourselves, well, I didn't accomplish very little, but, you know, maybe you accomplished more than you think. And I also think that our industry has accomplished so much over the last year as well. You know, changes have occurred. We are mask free, most of us, right? That was a mandate that came down from CMS. Happy, happy days was that, right? And so many of us were super excited to be able to put lipstick back on, right? Or to or to really have to put makeup on again because now our whole face was showing and looking at that. But you know, accomplishments really can come in all different shapes and sizes. And one of the most important things I think that each of us can accomplish is gaining knowledge. And I know that we are very blessed as professionals to have these opportunities with Link Senior with the activities strong movement and providing these opportunities every month as well as this summit once a year to help us gain that knowledge. So last year we talked about social prescription and how our lives have changed since March of 2020. But we also talked about how many of us still go back and forth between quarantining and group programming. And it's really been a challenge for us to get to this point. To, it's almost like we're climbing this big mountain to reach the summit. But here we are. And as I said, many of us are mask free. We're back to normal, the original normal, not the new normal. Or as we said in 2020, you know, the new normal. And in addition of the, of the voice of the activity and life enrichment professionals, here we are now once again focusing on purposeful programming. Go ahead and take us to the next slide. And I think it's really important too that we recognize and understand and ask ourselves maybe a bigger question. And that question is, is how are we programming now for the older adult? So obviously this is very dependent on what level of care we work in and it will be different for each one of us. But the bottom line is, is what we program should have meaning and purpose and how we program should involve the resident voice and should include resident choice as well. So our calendars really should involve varied programming that is engaging and adaptable to the people we serve. And we should also look for new and exciting opportunities or programs that will bring joy within our communities. So programming can be tricky and challenging as we know. And we're going to spend some time focusing on two very important words and together determine the best way to create that quality programming that allows our residents to reach the summit in the quality of life. So that first word is, go ahead, Charles, let's let's roll it out and let's show what our first word is here. Ah, entertainment, right? So here we go. According to, I love this, according to English101.com, there's six categories for entertainment. They are music, games, comedy, theater, cinema, performance is one, literature, and sports. And Wikipedia, which we all love, Wikipedia, right, is entertainment in any activity which provides diversion, or permits people to amuse themselves in their leisure time and may also provide fun, enjoyment, and laughter. And so I want to I want to ask Carrie Fairchild of Activity Connection, you know, you heard the word entertainment. What what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the or when you see the word entertainment? Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, <clears throat> when I think about the word entertainment, I think about something that's happening around me, either watching or listening, that's holding my attention and interest. Uh, something as simple as watching the birds is entertaining to me. But entertainment doesn't always necessarily mean that it makes you laugh or brings a smile to your face. For example, I love horror movies. I like the mystery and I like to get scared. And I also like when a film touches me so deeply that I just cry myself to bits, right? That's my entertainment. And like all humans, we have so many interests and differences. Uh, even if a horror movie is not your cup of tea, it still could be someone else's. 
So knowing what each of your community members' interests are, really, really getting to know them is so, so important. <clears throat> so I'll tell a little story. Excuse me. <clears throat> so long time ago, I was an activity director and I was also the driver of the bus of my community. Hats off to all of you who also drive the bus. I came up with the activity called Drive Along, Sing Along. Probably could have thought of a more creative name for it, but that's what it was, nice and clear. Uh, basically, I would get everybody on the bus and we would hand out popcorn and drive around town while I sang at the top of my lungs. No music, just me. And some chose to sing along and some didn't. Some ate the popcorn and some didn't. Some shouted out the usual song requests and some just looked out the window <clears throat> and enjoyed the ride. Each person on the bus got something out of this little adventure. It entertained all of the senses, listening to music, smelling the tape and tasting the popcorn, you know, looking at the sights, feeling the bus bouncing up and down and conversing with their fellow travelers. <clears throat> but even the brain was engaged. They were thinking about the lyrics. They were reminiscing about the songs and thinking about what to request next. Believe it or not, one of the favorite songs was On Top of Old Smokey. And of course, it's a song where I can never remember the verses in the correct order. But they were entertained. And I believe that a big factor in the success of this activity was the tone. Uh, the seniors, they latch on, latched onto my, my positive energy and my enthusiasm for the event. Uh, getting them excited beforehand because it was, wasn't just a ride, a bus ride. It was a fantastic experience that happened to be on a bus, right? They were so entertained that I eventually had to add a second drive along, sing along into the week. <clears throat> I told my administrator I needed a, a bigger bus, but they didn't think so. <clears throat> so when it comes to entertainment, you don't necessarily need anything fancy or complicated. And it's always more engaging if you can try to work in ways to incorporate multiple experiences at once, sort of killing two birds with one stone, but I'm not really a big fan of that term. <laughs> I think that's awesome, Carrie. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. And I know I've saw a few comments coming in that they love the idea of having a drive along, sing along experience. And <laughs> feel free to use that. <laughs> yeah, and providing entertainment. And see, that's what it's all yeah. about is entertaining and yeah. and giving, you know, opportunity for for that ability to feel amused or to feel relaxed or to have those different feelings of of pleasure. And the and, tone is so important. Yes. Creating that experience with the tone, you know. Yeah. Somebody suggested you feed the birds with one seed. Maybe you do it that way. <laughs> feed two birds with one seed. I like that one. I think that's a great idea. And somebody else suggested they do monthly <clears throat> trivia on wheels. So that's really cool uh -huh. too. That's trivia to it. <laughs> totally. Of, if you're not musically inclined, but we all that's know Carrie is musically inclined oh. to see beautiful singing voice. <laughs> all right, let's go on to the next word. Okay, Charles, tell us what the next word is there. Go ahead. Yes, engagement. I love this term engagement. This has been one of our big buzzwords I know over the last few years, but according to, you know, Cambridge Dictionary, there's five definitions of for engagement. Obviously, the main definition or the number one definition that many of us probably had come to mind was the intent to marry. But I'm sure we all know that's not really the definition we're talking about right now. So the definition that I would like to focus on is the process of encouraging people to be interested in something or become involved with something. So other words that maybe come to mind that are associated with engagement are captivation, enthrallment, immersion, intentness. But if you notice, all of those words encompass action. And I think that is really an important process of what engagement is all about, is creating action. So Linda, I want to ask you now, what comes to mind to you when you think of the word engagement? Hmm, that's so funny that you say engagement actually refers to that, that period of time before marriage. It, it's a promise, right? 
uh, along with that, there is excitement, that feeling of, of, oh my gosh, someone cares about me. Someone is watching out for me. They are committed to me. And, and there is a connection, a sense of belonging, a sense of appreciation, a want to actively participate in that relationship. So that connection becomes stronger. And that's a choice that is made freely. That sounds familiar, right? With regard to engagement in activities and life enrichment, we want this. And, and to get this, we want to look at the process. How does the program work? And, and whether or not it is effective. And we need to look closely at the nature and sequence of activities needed to carry out a, a successful program to facilitate that active engagement. Uh, what are the specifics, the where, the how, and the what? And, and, and what are the equipment or supplies that are needed? And, and are the programs filling a need? Are they, are they taking place on time? And, and what are the technical skills needed from staff as well as as the elders we serve? And, and what kind of training do the staff need? So, so how do we know what we're doing is working? How, how do we measure engagement and, and satisfaction? How do we do this? Well, we can look at, at resident council, we can look at quality assurance and performance improvement projects, uh, satisfaction surveys with the residents and, and their families, or, or we could do group observation surveys. And we can look at what is going on in our sensory programs and our one-to-one our -one room visits. These are the methods to measure. And, and Link Seniors platform also enables you to collect this valuable data so that we're able to make those critical decisions regarding programming and level of engagement. And, and when you look at all of the data, what are the outcomes? Is the degree of satisfaction and engagement expressed by the residents and families acceptable? Is there a, a good change or a lack of change in the elder as a result of the service you provided? What, what needs to happen in the program to produce a positive result? And are the meaningful standards for, for the high functioning elder being met as well as the elders with moderate to lower functioning cognitive issues? Are you meeting the different needs expressed in these different populations? And, and once you get all this information together, you can pretty much answer the next few questions I'm about to ask, like who attends activities of interest with an invite? Who attends activities of interest independently? And who interacts with their peers appropriately during discussion groups? And who completes creative projects during structured sessions? And, and what types of independent leisure activities are being offered and encouraged? And who asks when the next activity is scheduled? Mm -hmm. This means that this particular person is still engaged, even though the program is over and they are looking forward to the next program. And the power, that's the power of excited anticipation that cannot be underestimated. And this is the power of engagement. And these are the things that we're looking for. And this is how we, we measure the value of, of the activities we provide, that level of active engagement. This is also how we get to know our residents and anticipate their needs. Um, oh, Alyssa, I, I'd be curious to see what people think about engagement. Yeah, I think we should open the chat up to that and allow some people to respond a little bit. I did get a couple ones in here that I was looking at, and I love this one that talks about when they use words like engaged when they're writing up their progress note or anything like that, they utilize the term, you know, as evidenced by, and then describing what the resident will physically do to indicate engagement. And obviously that varies by resident or person's capabilities, but I think that is super cool that they're taking the time to show the evidence. And that's that's a really great concept too in understanding you know, the process of engagement and showing how engagement does and how it works. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really cool to look at that. Ah, Lisa, that's a really good comment too. They have an activity council where the residents tell her what they want to do and how they want to be engaged. And somebody else says, Julie here says, touching the soul, a unique soul. Obviously, engagement is 
hard to measure. And that is truly a challenge when it comes to measuring engagement. And yeah, I love that that concept too of measuring engagement. And obviously it's going to be based on individuality, person-centered care, the preferences that we allow for them to do. And yes, surveying, I know Linda, you talked about that. You asked some really intriguing questions that I think a lot of times we get lost up in that concept, you know, uh, those residents that attend activities independently. I think that's one that we get kind of lost in because so many times we want to see residents engaged in group activities. You know, we want to see them active and doing everything, whatever's going on in the big room or anything like that, instead of really recognizing that pursuing leisure interests, pursuing independent choices is just as important as coming and playing or participating in a large group activity. And I, th I think that's really cool. A lot of great comments coming in, encouraging residents to attend the preferential activities, um, involvement with verbalization, eye contact, attentiveness, expression of emotions. I think that's really cool too. Somebody did question, you know, how do we get residents to engage? You know, that's a great question because a lot of times we get lost in that. Again, is just trying to meet numbers or meet quotas that are set forth by corporations or, you know, communities or even state standards or national standards to, to put that out there put that out there. So any thoughts on that, how we would go about engaging residents or to get them engaged? Linda, do you have any thought on that? Or what do you think? Carrie, either one of you? There's so many different ways to get people engaged. I mean, you have to get on their level on a one-to-one, -one, get to know them individually as people, you know, what drives their boat, right? <laughs> Somebody says food. That's a great response. And right, Barbara, bonding. That is so important too. In order to get somebody to engage, you need to know them. I think that is the key concept too. And knowing who they are and what their background is and knowing what makes them smile or what makes them tick. Perfect. All right, Charles, will you go on to the next slide, please? So I think it's really cool question now that we're going to ask ourselves, and that is, which do you prefer? Do you prefer to be engaged or do you prefer to be entertained? And I think that is a key question, too, to ask of yourselves. A lot of times, you know, our thought process is always focused and centered around our residents or the people we serve in our communities. And I think that is key in importance. But one of the questions I like to ask of people I work with is how do you prefer to be? How do you prefer? Do you prefer to be entertained or do you prefer to be engaged? And I think uh, we're getting a lot of engagement. Um, of course, that is super important. Some people have said both. Um, some people want to be entertained. Some people want to be engaged. I think at the end of the day, when I come home from my long day of shift of working with the people I work with, I prefer to just be entertained, right? I don't have, I don't really feel like I want to be engaged. And, um, but both is important too. Like Carrie mentioned, you know, with the entertainment aspect that she loves horror movies. And the first thing I thought of too, when she talked about her drive along sing along was maybe doing a bus tour of horror movie places. You know, there's a there's a monster museum nearby that I've always wanted to go to, but I think I'm a little too scared to do that because horror horror movies are not my forte. <laughs> um, but I think that's really cool. And how often do we even provide that opportunity for somebody that may enjoy horror movies, you know, in their community? Do we show horror movies regularly? Maybe, maybe not, depending on the person. Uh, I like that. R scary coloring pages. There's something for you, Carrie, to think about. I like yeah. that a lot. Um, very cool. And I love this thought too here. It just kind of went fast, but I think entertainment, if you enjoy it, will also engage you as I love going to live concerts. And that is an enjoyment where I feel engaged. Absolutely. You can have both in doing that and, and participating in that. Oh, somebody else does a haunted bus tour during October. Oh, that's, that's really cool. <laughs> I love that. And I think that's really cool. And setting them up for successful engagement is seating them where they can maximize their full potential. Great. And that's what it's all about is maximizing their full potential. Somebody else says they build a haunted house in their therapy gym. Carrie, I knew you would like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> you, you were saying like at the end of the day, I was going to comment. 
I think a lot of it has to do with the person's mood. You know, mm-hmm. you have to be in the right mood to want to be engaged or it's just going to, or entertain, or it's just going to annoy you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want to be entertained right now. <laughs> the mood right. has a whole, whole <laughs> part of it, you know. Thank you, Carrie, for bringing up such an important thought because we have been, as activity professionals, life enrichment professionals, we are so geared to that engagement entertainment concept all the time Mm -hmm. and we feel the need that we if the resident is not you know as I already said I think I'm repeating myself but if the resident's not out of their room they're not being engaged and oh there's so many things that are going on in the room too that we have to be respectful of Mm -hmm. to that person to be able to participate in whatever they prefer to do in their room and exactly and Sometimes you go into the day where you're, and I, I know I, I did this where sometimes I felt like I had to be on. I'm the, I'm the showman. I'm engaging and getting everybody happy, but that doesn't necessarily have to be all the time. Sometimes it feels like it might, but that's, you know, I guess that's the entertainment part, but there's also the engagement is so important and they're so different, you know, anyway. (laughs) <laughs> yes. And I love that this comment here that sometimes they feel overwhelmed and then they don't enjoy themselves anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Overstimulation, we have to be very conscientious of us too. That too. All right. So let's look at how we can create quality engagement programs. Charles, I'll go ahead and have you go to the next slide. And we know that there'll be times when entertainment is appropriate. Yes. But creating quality engagement programs is vital in our industry and should be done daily. And so then we ask the next question of ourselves, what is considered quality? And I think let's turn to the federal regulations because that's always something that I enjoy reading. I know some people may find that really boring, but that's what entertains and engages me is reading the beautiful red Bible, as I call it, the 800 plus page Bible of federal (laughs) regulatory research. And the findings and the observations of positive resident outcomes confirm that activities are an integral component of a resident's life. And residents have indicated that daily life and involvement should be meaningful. And then activities are meaningful when they reflect a person's interest and lifestyle and are enjoyable to the person, help the person feel useful, and then also provide a sense of belonging. And maintaining contact and interaction with the community is an important aspect of a person's well-being, and it facilitates feelings of connectedness and self-esteem. So involvement in community includes interacting, such as assisting maybe the resident to maintain their ability to independently a shop, to attend community theater, to go to local concerts, the library, and even participate in community groups. And all residents have that need for engagement in meaningful activities. So for residents maybe with dementia, The lack of engaging activities can cause boredom, loneliness, and or frustration, which then results in distress and agitation. So we know activities must become individualized and customized based on the resident's needs. And quality then is described as something to provide meaning and purpose and allows for social interaction and the ability to create relationships, to be physically engaging and cognitively stimulating. So let's take a closer look at each one of these. So go ahead to the next slide, Charles, thank you. So let's start with meaning and purpose. So when someone feels like there is meaning under purpose in their lives, then their overall well-being is improved. And so activities then that provide maybe self-actualization or spirituality or religious opportunities or even volunteer opportunities and engagement can fit into this category. So opportunities to engage even in life review and to reminisce. So thinking about that, Linda, what do you think of when you hear the term meaning and purpose? Hmm, meaning and purpose. Yeah, that's, that's our role, you know, creating meaning and purpose in order to increase the quality of life for the elders that we serve. And as activity and life enrichment professionals, we add value to people's lives. This is what we do. And if you look at FTAG 679, I, most of you are probably familiar with this federal regulation. Uh, the facility must provide based on a comprehensive assessment and care plan and the preferences of each resident 
an ongoing program to support residents in their choice of activities, both facility-sponsored group and individual activities and independent activities designed to meet the interests of and support the physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being of each resident, encouraging both independence and interaction in the community. So that's the federal regulation 679. Mm. So we're creative. We've had to think outside the box these past three years to, to meet the needs and preferences of elders we serve in order to meet this regulation. And, and we're looking for activities that do make a difference and have value, activities that have a purpose. And we're looking for ways to find adaptations that will promote independence. And so how do we measure these things besides just looking at attendance? Um, I, you know, I talked about this earlier. We touched about, upon it. How can you tell that your elders are engaged and, and that they've been given the tools that they need so they can feel empowered to keep moving forward? And, and what about you? Were you engaged? Um, and one of the ways to a successful program is to make sure that you bring your part to the table, um, your energy, your, your positive energy, because the elders we serve, they borrow from our energy and, and spirit just enough so that they can get going on their own. And, and that's how you get more focus of attention, that increased involvement and, and positive feelings regarding the program, which provides an incentive to continue. And then they look forward to the next activity. And activities should provide that sense of instant gratification and satisfaction. Uh, every community is different. But if I do an art program with my folks, they're looking for a project that is practical, something, something that has a purpose. And But your folks may be okay with doing an abstract piece of art. Um, but you have to be really careful of who your audience is and what they are willing to accept and some folks may be more open-minded to something like that and others, not so much. But whatever it is that you do, you wanna instill a feeling of competence and make sure that they get that feeling of success because that's really important. If you want them to come back to your program, whatever it is. And the approach is more than half the battle because some folks are easy to grab and bring into your programs and others give you a run for your money, make you really work it. I mean, remember the last two years, going on three now, most of these folks were socially isolated. And now some of them are afraid to come out of their room. So you got to give them a lot of TLC, a lot of reassurance and support. I mean, just last week, I had a unit that was on restriction because of COVID. So, you know, even though we'd like to think that this is over, it's not. Yeah. And so you, yeah, and you have to get to know the person. We said this before, whatever it is that you're doing, you must connect the task to the person the appropriate task to the appropriate person, and you must give the task meaning, provide that adaptation and meet the elders where they are at. And um, this brings us to social interaction, uh, Alyssa. What, what kind of social activities can we gain or engage our elders in? Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Yes, go ahead and change that slide, Charles. And one of the comments that I saw come through that kind of relates to this social activity uh, interaction or social interaction is that a fantastic program can fail in the wrong setting. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was such a deep thought because that is so true. Because social interaction, you know, can fail if we don't really know how to properly socialize with the person we're working with. And social, because social interaction is all about engagement. And I think that is the process too, is communicating, creating relationships. And there's a few activities that do fit that criteria as well. Parties, gatherings, book clubs, discussion groups. Those are key things that maybe we can do more frequently in our communities to process that social interaction, to create opportunities for communication. Not everybody is a great communicator. Not everybody is extroverted, maybe like myself, that likes to go out and say, hey, how are you doing today? You know, and being a part of that and taking that, I like that deep dive, as Wayne says, into really effectively communicating of that with that. And Carrie, what are your thoughts on social interaction when you hear that term? Yeah, well, when I hear the term social interaction, I first think, of a party, right? Everybody's getting together. You think of all the people together and they're all going to chat and, and uh, laugh with each other and, you know, maybe sing happy birthday face to face, individuals spending time together. 
Um, but sometimes though, social interaction isn't so much fun. Um, there can be competition or conflict involved, like during some bingo games. <laughs> uh, uh, try to stay positive and find compromise. We know things like that are sometimes really hard to find a resolution to. Um, and social interaction can also be nonverbal, you know, a wave, a wink and a smile, you know, those little gestures are not so small to some, especially if there are folks who aren't that social, that go to activities type of person, you know. And there are so many ways to foster social interaction. Of course, gatherings and multiple with multiple people is is the big one. Sing alongs, birthdays, barbecues, drive along, sing along on ride on the bus. Mm -hmm. um, but social interaction means any interaction with another person. Uh, so small groups like book clubs or discussion groups, um, like Alyssa said, and those little one on one taking time to sit with a senior and give them that personal interaction is so important. And creating these opportunities and moments for this social interaction is good for the brain. It makes people feel good and connected and can even um, improve mental sharpness. Um, so the next time you're passing your senior friend on the, in, in the hallway, you know, take a second and just give them a wink or a wave or smile, you know, could make a lot of difference to them. Even that little tiny interaction, you know. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Carrie, for, for sharing so much about social interaction and reminding us that social interaction can also be nonverbal. I, I love that thought too. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Charles. Obviously, the main purpose of our relationship or our profession is to allow for relationships to be created. And a relationship is really a state of being connected. Connection is crucial. We all crave that connection. And I think that is super important too to recognize too, that as humans, we're naturally sociable. So it makes sense that the better our relationships are, the happier we are. And that can apply to our personal life, but it also obviously applies to what we do as activity professionals and life enrichment professionals is that we need to have good relationships with the people we are we associate with every single day. When we have those good relationships, we will feel happier, we will feel more engaged, and we will also feel productive in what we're doing. And there's so many benefits that come from having good relationships. Obviously, the first one is increased productivity. Now, we see that regularly, maybe with our residents that we work with. If they feel happy and engaged, they're going to do something like that. Somebody mentioned that they filled 5,000 Easter eggs at Easter time, right? It took three days, 12 residents participated in that. But what an amazing accomplishment of feeling engaged and creating a relationship as you're filling the A's eggs conversation will happen, right? I think that is such an important thing is creating that conversation. It also helps to improve morale. You know, most of the times we're going to generally be happier at work or where we work, who we work with, if we're happy. That's just the key thing too. And looking at that as well, you know, and what happens with creating relationships is number one is to have open and honest communication. Um, I am a firm believer of validation therapy. I know valid, the validation program is one of the key partners with, um, with Link Senior, with NAP, with NCAP, and with Activity Connection. And one of the things that's talked about in validation therapy is creating a conversation. And a lot of times, some people may think, well, that's considered, quote, therapeutic lying, right? And that's not the case. It's all about creating a relationship and having a conversation. It is getting into the level of where that person is. It's accepting what they believe as reality. And that's important, too, when you're having open and honest conversations is listening, because listening is probably the number one thing that we can do in an effective communication, because active listening is all about building that trust. That's key, is we want to build that trust. And respecting others is to create that opportunity as well. So obviously, if we're committed to something as we are committed to engagement and, and providing opportunities, we need to be committed to ourselves to be respectful and appreciative of others. And like, like Carrie mentioned, you know, 
we're always on, right? We're on as activity professionals. And when we go home, we turn off. That's something that we do for regularly. But while we are on, we need to remain as positive as possible, you know, and keeping that professional attitude and thinking about the fact that asking questions when you're in a relationship, when you're in a communicative relationship will help with that engagement and help with with continuing that relationship all around. Because that's what it's all about is creating a relationship with the people that we work with on a regular basis. So Charles, go ahead to the next slide. So we the next part was physically engaging. So we look at that. So the benefits then of physical engagement maybe include a better mood and memory or even improved health. So obviously being creative with your fitness is important when it comes to physically engaging. I know personally when I engage in, in a physically engaging activity, I feel mentally better as well. So I find the two go hand in hand. So some creative activities that maybe we could do that are physically engaging, uh, weight bearing activities with weights or yoga, tai chi or kung fu or dance or zumba, ooh, laughter yoga, I like that. And even bingo size, which is a great program that's out of the University of Kentucky that talks about how to engage physicality with playing bingo. So there's ways to be able to, to provide physically engaging activities. And so, uh, Linda, what are some physically engaging activities you do with your residents? Well, Melissa, you've already mentioned creativity with fitness, and that's the key, creativity. I mean, you could do gentle stretching, low-impact exercises that focus on strength and flexibility and balance and include modifications or alternative exercises to accommodate residents with mobility limitations. And you could use props like resistance bands and light weights or exercise balls at variety and, and increase that engagement. And, and you can encourage that social interaction among participants during movement groups where rhythm and music can be enjoyed with props like scarves and rhythm instruments or even parachute play. And you can modify the sports activities. You can adapt popular sports like bowling, golf, or basketball to accommodate the abilities and mobility levels of residents. And you can use equipment and modifications such as the lightweight balls or low nets or adaptive golf clubs or, or just those seated versions of these sports and, and create friendly competitions or leagues to foster engagement and, and teamwork among the residents. I, I saw the other day, um, Carrie and Alyssa, a really creative game. You know that game where you whack the mole? The, these folks at this community rigged a, a table with holes in it, big enough for the person who played the mole to stick their head up through the holes and, and the elders had their inflatable bats to whack the mole each time this poor person stuck their head up through the hole. I've seen it was, that. It was hilarious. Hilarious, so yeah. funny. Yes, everyone had so much fun uh, doing it and I, I, I loved watching it. So, and of course you have to make sure everything is, is safe so no one gets hurt, but it was all in good fun. And, um, or you can do intergenerational sports or games, uh, um, organize these activities where the residents can engage uh, with children or younger adults from the community and collaborate with local schools or sports teams or youth organizations to, to arrange these interactions and, and select activities that allow for collaboration, interaction, and, and friendly competition between residents and younger participants. Um, and these intergenerational activities, they provide that physical stimulation, offer opportunities for social connections. Um, uh, you got to remember, though, to assess the residents' capabilities and limitations and consult with the healthcare professionals when needed and, and provide appropriate supervision and support during physical engagement activities. Next slide, please. So Linda, and, uh, before I just yes. to share a couple of thoughts that came in the comments before you get into the green prescription. Sure. Um, I love, somebody mentioned they did human candy land. Um, oh. They had a balloon volleyball tournament, the residents against the staff, very competitive. Um, somebody else did do the whack-a-mole during nursing home week, or <laughs> skilled nursing care week. So funny, Super yes. cool. And yeah. I love what you're going to talk about next with the green prescription. So go ahead. Do yeah, that. Thank Next you. Slide. Thank you. Yeah, the green prescription is a term used to describe the practice of prescribing activities in nature as a means of improving health and, and well-being. And it's a term that's familiar in the UK. 
and is uh, trying to take root in the U.S. It is uh, particularly relevant for the elderly population because spending time in nature has numerous benefits for physical, mental, and emotional health. And, and elders just don't spend enough time outdoors getting that much needed vitamin D. So, um, you know, uh, here is a resident from my community. This is a picture of, of, of her. I love her. She's enjoying the fruits of her labors. We work with uh, the Evergreen Minds Group. It's a not-for-profit focused on bringing nature experiences to persons with dementia. And my folks work with them to plant seedlings, which were then moved to a dementia-friendly garden at Vassar College. This is in New York, where I'm at. And once the uh, vegetables grew and were harvested by volunteers and student interns, some of the vegetables were brought back for the residents to enjoy. And I was able to use fresh basil and mozzarella with the garden tomatoes and some olive oil for a well-deserved treat, enjoyed outdoors on the patio, and the residents loved it. And I'm so looking forward to doing this again this summer. So, so for the green prescription for elderly individuals who would benefit from activities in nature, think about doing things like nature walks, um, in natural settings like parks and gardens or nature trails. And, uh, you know, this, this encourages them, them to engage in, in moderate physical activity. You enjoy the beauty and tranquility of, of the natural environment. Um, and you emphasize the importance of being mindful and present in nature, taking time to observe their surroundings and, and appreciate the sensory experiences. And you can do some gardening or horticultural therapy, simple things like planting, watering, even weeding or harvesting. Um, this improves motor skills. It promotes a sense of accomplishment. And uh, you can do nature-based arts and crafts. You, you can um, use materials from the natural environment, such as leaves and flowers or twigs, uh, to create artwork. And this promotes creativity. It, it provides a sense of connection with nature and offers a calming and therapeutic outlet for self-expression. You can do uh, animal-assisted activities, pet therapy, and, and, and this, uh, this can incorporate interactions with animals as part of the green prescription. You can arrange visits from therapy animals or facilitate interactions with friendly animals in nature settings, and, and this can provide companionship and reduce stress and promote positive emotional experiences. And you can do outdoor group activities, things like uh, picnics, uh, group exercises, outdoor games, nature-based educational programs. Uh, this fosters those social connections and a sense of community. And um, you want to also promote mindfulness and meditation practices in natural environments. If you can encourage individuals to find a quiet, and peaceful uh, space in nature to practice mindfulness and deep breathing. Um, this can also reduce uh, stress and improve mental clarity and, and promote a sense of, of inner calm and well being. And um, the Green Prescription recognizes the therapeutic value of nature and, and aims to harness its benefits for, for elderly individuals. If not only provides physical activity, but also offers opportunities for relaxation and sensory stimulation and socialization and a sense of connection with the natural world. So Alyssa, yeah. next thing. Cognitive yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about cognitive stimulating. Go ahead, Charles, pass that slide along. So obviously you mentioned some great opportunities too with cognitive stimulating activities that not only help our brains, but also help to improve or increase our social functioning. And some of those activities may be utilizing socialization with brain games or cross body movements that help with rewiring or exercise and trivia together or even lifelong learning. And I know activity connection is huge in providing these resources for cognitively stimulating activities. And so Carrie, can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So. Um... We, we have a lot of programming that is wonderful for stimulating those brains. Um, I'm gonna be listing quite a few 
uh, today, and I know it's a lot of information at once. So if you would like to get a list that I'm going to rattle off in a minute, um, you can email me at marketing at activityconnection.com. And I'd be happy to send this list your way, kind of a, a guide for stimulating activities on Activity Connection. Um, when it comes to socialization using brain games, we have a lot of opportunities. Um, there are cranium crunches and puzzles also found on the holiday pages. Um, and they can be used for group brain games as well as individual. Um, and as well as giving you the content for brain games, we often provide tips on how to use the activity. Uh, we also like to encourage everyone to think outside of the box, to know your resident, like we've been talking about, and to use or adapt these programs to meet their needs. For example, our who, what, where activities, if you use that, you can put clues on bulletin boards each day, and then socialization will naturally occur because people will gather to read that together as they're passing through and converse with each other. You could even start a puzzle pal club with our puzzles and they could do that together as a group. Um, we also have scavenger hunts like the desert flora and fauna in the month of August, birthday games of course in our birthday kit, our special days page, which is quite popular, often includes lots of ideas for simple word games. Um, there's our getting to know you bingo, which was in our professional pride page in month, in, in sorry, in May. Uh, the Daily Chronicle, which a lot of people love, is very popular and has lots of ideas, but we also have the Daily Chronicle Extra, which is a bonus Daily Chronicle and often, often includes word puzzles and trivia. Um, those are usually passed out um, a lot of times at like the dining table where folks are waiting for their meals and they can, you know, get some brain stimulation before they eat. Um, we also have table talk. Table talk tidbits is a table tent that you print out and you can put on, the, on any tables, um, but it's full of facts and humor, brain puzzles, and um, there's a daily challenge with cognitive exercise on, or, uh, on it too. Excuse me. For activities for cross body movement, you can check out um, the Florida Keys workout, the key to key game from July. And there was a lot of uh, featured in the Dance Craze music program in April. For exercise and trivia combined, we are actually thrilled to be featuring fitness trivia by Whole Brain Health. You may have heard of them. Um, and so May and June have videos from Whole Brain Health. It's uh, a new fun collaboration. And um, so really be sure to check that one out. Um, some of our activity connection videos include light exercise. However, we sometimes hear that participants don't always like to combine exercise with video watching. This is where activity professionals can help glorify the benefits of integrating exercise or movement. And in into an otherwise just cognitive program and encourage it. And if they know the why, it's more purposeful and the residents might be more willing to participate. Um, some movement activity ideas using our content might be starting a walking club, um, using our trivia questions on the walk. Um, you, on the first day of the month, you can use our IQ puzzle and call it Wise Walkers or um, you can use our trivia and our slideshows for indoor walking programs if it's like Texas right now is 100 degrees or plus. Um, and you can pin trivia questions down the hallway and then, um, then they'll pin the answer further down the hall. And it could be called trivia tour or walls of wisdom as they go, you know. Our easy uh, Rem Zen slideshow can be laid out as a walking path. And, you know, you can do it as you walk and it could be called a walk down memory lane. And we, of course, we have our travel log slideshow and it could be called travel log tour, something like that. Um, and finally, when it comes to lifelong learning, every month we provide several lifelong learning programs, lifelong learning in our holiday programs, in our men's programs and special days, those often include 
archive discussions that you can have access to. Um, and then also you can click on more discussions within categories and there are additional lifelong programs found on other pages. So the more you explore, the more you, you see. And, and, we, and we like to include those archive discussions because they're so important. You know, the, the lifelong learning is wonderful. It's good. Lots of great comments in the chat, Carrie, about activity oh. connection and, and the resources. And of course, some people said they would not probably survive the day if they didn't pass out the Daily Chronicle. On I the know. Timely manner, right? I so would get in so much trouble <laughs> if I forgot that morning. Mm. <laughs> Charles, go ahead to the next slide. And I think it's super important as we wrap up our time together is to discuss the calendar. And as you can see, you know, activity programs that have meaning and purpose, that social interaction, creating relationships, physical engagement, and cognitively stimulating should be what makes up our calendar. So the calendar, as we know, is a tool that maybe many of us are required to utilize within our communities. And again, I want to point out the calendar is a tool. We have this tool available to guide our residents in creating quality engagement. And our calendars should be based on residents' needs and interests. So what that means is that the calendar is catered around your population. It's a tool, it's a resource. And so we know federal regulation, here we go again, you know, residents, staff, and families, they should be allowed to interact in ways that reflect daily life. So instead of informal, activity programs, or maybe we have more involved ongoing activities in living areas, utilizing those care planned approaches that we put together, you know, with chores, preparing foods, meeting with other residents, choosing spontaneous activities. And so it's, it's really been reported, you know, that many cultural changed homes might not have a traditional activity calendar. And instead, they're focusing on just community life. And they're focusing on regular old engagement that happens just at any time spontaneously, or even, you know, that title activities director that we've been limited to. Maybe we have another job title that we look at that. And so thinking about that, how are, we, how are you catering the calendar to meet the needs of your populations? How many of us are still stuck in that traditional mindset of 10 to 12 activities a day? How is that considered quality? I, 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 it baffles my mind. Linda, I bet you provide 10 to 12 activities a day, oh, right? Goodness, 10 <laughs> to 12 activities a day. I, I would say that the strength is not in the quantity of programs, but in the quality of programming. I mean, we're wanting to look at their individualized interests and preferences and want to set realistic goals, right? So the calendar is a communication tool. It's part of our marketing. And marketing is also a huge component. There, there is a saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, meaning that when someone looks at an image, multiple ideas can be conveyed in that single image. And there is much to be said about that image. I'm a very visual person. So when I look at a photograph that is representational of my community, I want to see the people in the photograph doing something meaningful. I want to see them engaged. And that's a great way to measure the pleasure that's being experienced because you can see it and you want others to see it too. And not just in the monthly calendars and newsletters you create in-house, but the social media outlets that are used by your company to go beyond the confines of your community and reach the outside world. And that's why social media is so important. Because then the families see it, the owners and operators see it, the stakeholders see it, and that validates what we do and how important it is and how much what we do contributes to quality of life. And even if they don't understand how we do what we do, they see the results, the return on investment, all of our hard work. And as an activity and life enrichment professionals, we use that feedback we get so we can continue to cultivate, improve, and refine our programming. And so sum it up, I just want to say a few quick things before we end here, because I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but the types of programming to enhance resident engagement that should be reflected on the activities calendar should be social connection activities, cognitive stimulation activities, creative expression activities like, like art therapy, music therapy, writing workshops, and other creative outlets, uh, physical engagement, which we talked about, and intergenerational programming. All right. And the strategies for incorporating these person-centered care principles into your calendar, you should consider 
uh, the cultural backgrounds of your, your folks, your, their hobbies, their past experiences. You want to involve the residents in the planning and decision-making process. Someone mentioned that they had their residents in a group. Um, I had my residents in an activity planning committee at a community I worked in. So please consider this. This empowers them to know that they're making a meaningful contribution to the community that they're living in. You wanna offer flexibility and choice in the calendar. Um, you want to make sure that there are multi-sensory experiences available, um, activities that incorporate elements like music, aromatherapy, tactile objects, or visual aids. And, um, and this will engage residents on different levels and enhances their overall experience. And continuity and routine. Um, establishing consistent schedules for activities to provide a sense of structure, familiarity. Uh, you know, this ensures the residents have a clear understanding of what to expect and when, and it reduces anxiety and, and increases engagement. But of course, this, <laughs> this depends upon the need of your community as there is value in having special event programs. Because, you know, variety is the spice of life. And you, you need much. to have uh, staff training and support as well. So thank you so much for having yes. us. Yes. Yeah, um, Addisa and Linda and Kerry, thank you so much for uh, opening up our, our summit and making this day, this amazing day, awesome. I just want to share a couple of thoughts before we move on to our second section. And uh, these are words directly to uh, NAP and NCAP, which is that, you know, you, Anissa, and you, Linda, and previously Don and uh, Amy, and the rest of your teams, you've shown amazing leadership in unprecedented time. And I always like to think of, you know, senior living is about living, mm -hmm. but there is no living without activities. And so for what you do for our industry, just, you know, thank you. So I encourage the audience to consider becoming members of NAP to take the, I think, essential step, which is to become certified with NCAP. Mm -hmm. And a quick word about activity connection. I personally think that activity connection is magic because you take one activity director and you add activity connection and you get two activity directors. It's such an awesome tool. So I encourage you all to also uh, consider activity connection. So with that, we're going to end the recording. Thank you so much, Addison, uh, Linda, and Carrie. Feel free to stay on, just turn off your camera. And then we're now going to move on to our second program.